All right, so psilocybin. This is so interesting. It, uh, did I say it right, psilocybin? Yeah, psilocybin. Okay, so psilocybin found in magic mushrooms shows promise as a treatment for depression by Tony Hicks on May 3rd. So the article by Medical News Today discusses the potential of psilocybin, a compound found in magic mushrooms, as a treatment for depression. The article explains that recent studies have shown promising results where psilocybin therapy has helped individuals with depression experience significant improvements in their symptoms. Psilocybin appears to work by altering the connections of the brain, which can lead to changes in mood and perception. The article also highlights that psilocybin therapy involves more than just administering the drug. It is usually accompanied by psychological support from trained therapists. This combination of drug therapy and psychological supports helps patients process their experiences during psilocybin sessions more effectively. Researchers are optimistic about the therapeutic potential of psilocybin, especially for patients who have not responded well to traditional antidepressants, which is very common. I mean, antidepressants are are rough. Yeah. Um, however, the article notes that more research is needed to fully understand the benefits, risks, and mechanisms of psilocybin therapy for depression. Super interesting. Yeah. Like, so much research is coming out from um, mushrooms right now that's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so seafood, eggs, and meat may lower the risk of bipolar disorder. This is by Robbie Berman on May 3rd. So the article from Medical News Today discusses a recent study suggesting that omega-6 fatty acids may reduce the risk of developing bipolar disorder. So usually we associate this all with like cardiovascular health, but now we're finally getting into some research that may potentially lead to also mental health as well. Mm -hmm. So omega-6 fatty acids commonly found in foods like vegetable oils, nuts, and seeds have also been shown to play a role in brain health. The study highlights that individuals with higher levels of certain omega-6 fatty acids in their bodies had lower risk of experiencing bipolar disorder. This finding suggests that dietary choices that include omega-6 fatty acids could potentially be a preventative strategy against the development of bipolar disorder, emphasizing the importance of diet in mental health. The mind gut connection. Check out that episode. Yes. It's, it's true. One of so, our most popular. So much is coming out of that, out of the mind gut connection, how food and just like your gut health is so important yeah. into so many things. It's just more and more is coming out of it every day. Anyway, so... Oral drug as effective as topical care cream for male pattern baldness. We did do an episode on hair loss. It was so, one of our first episodes. It really was. Anyway, so um, Emily Harris on May 3rd, 2024. So a recent study published on JAMA found that the oral medication minoxidil is just as effective as a topical cream for treating male pattern baldness. This condition, also known as androgenic alopecia, affects many men and can lead to significant hair loss. Which, minoxidil has been used for like a really long time topically. So the study involved 68 men in Brazil aged 18 to 55 who were randomly assigned to take either a low-dose oral minoxidil pill or apply a 5% minoxidil topical solution. After the treatment period, researchers found no significant difference in hair density between the two groups, so oral or topical, indicating that both forms of the medication were equally as effective. However, the side effects varied between the two treatments. Those taking the oral medication reported more instances of excessive hair growth on their bodies and headaches, while those using the topical solution experienced more itching and eczema. Currently, the FDA has only approved topical minoxidil and oral finasteride, finasteride. for treating this type of hair loss. Despite the study suggests that low-dose oral minoxidil could be a good alternative for people who prefer taking a pill or who have trouble using the topical treatment. So in summary, if you're dealing with male pattern baldness, you might have the option to choose between pill or cream, which both work well. So, yeah. but they just come with different side effects. So you got to choose what you want to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like if you can just tolerate a topical instead of taking an oral, it's not necessary to have all those side effects. So you can have like with systemic medication. Right, right, right. Instead of just localized. Yeah. Um, And also... When you're taking oral minoxidil, it's not like it's just going to grow on the head. It's going to grow everywhere. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be hairy. That's the thing. And I, at least for women, yeah, that's not desired. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I've always said it like if I could laser myself from the neck down, I would. Yeah. <laughs> like, same, same, same. There's no need for me to have hair anywhere yeah. else. Anyway. All right. So ancient grains linked to improve type 2 diabetes outcomes. This is by Kelsey Costa. This, she's a registered dietitian on May 4th. The article from Medical News Today discusses the recent research on potential benefits with ancient grains in managing type 2 diabetes. It explains that ancient grains such as quinoa, amaranth, 
and mill is it millet i think it's millet millet yeah i think yeah. so too and millet have been found to have higher levels of fiber and other beneficial nutrients compared to more commonly consumed grains these nutrients can help improve blood sugar control reduce blood pressure which are crucial for managing type 2 diabetes the article also mentions that the incorporating the ancient grains into your diet could also lead to better overall health outcomes for individuals with this condition the findings suggest that ancient grains could be a valuable addition to dietary strategies aimed at treating and managing diabetes. Come on, guys. Let's get it. Yeah. Quinoa, like, come on, everyone. I, I like quinoa. Yeah. All right. So can olive oil, so we're going to continue on the food. <laughs> can olive oil help lower the risk of dementia-related death by Eileen Bailey on May 6, 2024? So the article on Medical News Today explores the potential health benefits of olive oil, particularly with its ability to lower the risk of dementia-related deaths. It's freaking mind blowing. Okay, that's a lot. Like that's a big deal. And the article discusses recent recent research findings that suggest a link between the regular consumption of olive oil and a reduced risk of dying from dementia. Mm -hmm. Olive oil, a key component of the Med Mediterranean diet, which is funny because Mario every time he has to suggest because he's family medicine, and every time he has to suggest like on his notes or whatever diet, he's like Mediterranean diet. Like well, across yeah. the board, he's just like Mediterranean I mean, diet. But it's the Mediterranean diet. You can't argue. Scientifically, it. has shown the most benefits. success. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you can't, you can't. Um, and it doesn't it. like cut out a lot of things with really like specific diets. It's just truly the way that they cook mm -hmm. is different, and the ingredients they use are more whole. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mediterranean is very good. Yeah, yeah. So Mediterranean diet, which is rich in healthy fats and antioxidants, which are believed to contribute to brain health. The research highlighted in the article indicates that the individuals who regularly include olive oil in their diet may have a lower risk of cognitive decline and dementia-related complications. This protective effect is attributed to the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties of olive oil, which may help reduce brain inflammation and oxidative stress, which are factors associated with the development of dementia. So this article also emphasizes the importance of dietary choices in maintaining cognitive health and preventing neurological diseases. It suggests that incorporating this olive oil into a balanced diet could be a simple and effective way to support brain health and reduce the risk of dementia-related mortality. So it's an easy thing, pretty much, like for you to add on and it'll only to benefit you, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So post-orgasmic illness syndrome remains a medical mystery <laughs> by, by yeah. Charles Bankhead on May 6th. So the main topic of this article, in which is deals with post-orgasmic illness syndrome, I feel like that should be a weekly on its own, right? was published on MedPage today. It's an ongoing enigma. I'm sorry. For a second there, I wanted to say angina. <laughs> That's a doctor in your game. That's a doctor, yeah. Yeah, and, like angina. Yeah. So it's an ongoing enigma surrounding post-orgasmic illness syndrome, so POIS. This condition is rare and it primarily affects males, manifests in a cluster of flu-like and allergy symptoms following climax or an orgasm. So despite years of study, the medical community still has many unanswered questions about POIS, including its causes and effective treatments. The article highlights the debilitating nature of this syndrome and its significant impact it has on lives and those affected. Oh, this is so sad. It's so sad. Like and you, why in males? I don't know, but you imagine like right after and then you just break out on like coughing and sneezing. Primarily like, affecting males. Yeah. Um, Flu-like symptoms after that. Nuts. I had never heard of this. I had never heard of this either. And then MedPage it's shit that we learned. MedPage. Like it came from a reputable, reputable source. source. It didn't just come out of like, you know. That is weird. I've never heard of that. I've never experienced that. So yeah, I mean, anyway. Genes known to increase the risk of Alzheimer's may actually be an inherited form sorry. of the disorder. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Oh, good. She just came from rounding, guys. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, know, guys. Like, I had an early day. Yeah, yeah. Form of the Disorder Researchers Say by Brenda Goodman on May 6, 2024. The article from CNN discusses a link between APOE4 gene and an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. This gene is one of the several forms of 
the APOE gene, and carrying one or two copies of this variant significantly raises the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's. The article explains that while having this gene does not guarantee that the person will develop Alzheimer's, it does increase the risk compared to those who do not carry this gene variant. The piece also highlights ongoing research efforts to understand how the APOE4 gene contributes to Alzheimer's disease progression. This research is crucial as it could lead to the development of targeted therapies that might prevent or delay the onset of the disease in individuals with this genetic risk. Additionally, the article touches on the importance of genetic testing and counseling for those who might be at risk, providing them with the information that could influence lifestyle choices and healthcare decisions. Which leads me to like, remember, I don't know if you saw the special on Chris Hemsworth that he found out that he has, I, I, I want to say it's this gene, but don't quote me. I'm not entirely sure if it's exactly this one, but he found out that he's predisposed, predisposed to developing Alzheimer's at some point in time. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a great, it was a great watch. Like it really was. I don't think it was on Netflix. It was like on Disney or Apple or one of those. But anyway, that's why he's taken a cut from like stardom or whatever. So he could focus more on his family and all that. I just, I love him. He's hot yeah. as shit, but he's also like a great person. A great person. Yeah. Um, and he has one of these genes or whatever. And then the question that I had for you is, would you want to know that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So I feel I'm more along the line. Yes, I totally get it. And look what he's doing. He's like using yeah. that information to change his life around. Mm -hmm. But I think he also is in a situation where oh, he can do that. Exactly. Okay. 100%. So he has a lot of money. Yeah. He doesn't okay. have to. So he doesn't yeah. have to do a movie this year. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. don't get me wrong. Big money, big things, big lifestyle. He has bills to pay. Okay. So I'm, I'm not saying yeah, but that. Still. But he is, it's easier for him 100%. to adjust his lifestyle. 100%. There are people that do not have no. that, that you, they have to keep going regardless. regularly. Yeah. Re regardless if you have it or not. I, yeah. okay. So, however, I will say, mm -hmm. I think it also depends on what disease we're talking about. Yeah. So yeah. Alzheimer's specifically, I would not want to know because I wouldn't even know when I had it. Yeah. Because that's the whole entire like blissfulness of of Alzheimer's is that the person yeah. that has it has no idea. Yeah. Obviously, they're going to have anxiety sometimes because they don't know where they are. Yeah. They're confused and things. So, yes. Okay. That's, you know, I get that. But at the end of the day, like they don't no it's their alzheimer's right and okay. if they do it's like for very small Breeds. moments that they're they gonna know. forget exactly okay exactly so for me yes it's more maybe i would do the test for my family right right you know what i mean but i would tell my family like don't tell me i don't want to know mm -hmm. or anything like mm -hmm. that or you would because, test a family member maybe or maybe i would test a family member but at the end of the day like that's such a personal yeah yeah, yeah. personal decision that at the end of the day, like, I'm not going to live my life every single day. What if today I start having symptoms? Yeah, like, that's true. Yeah. What, you know, it's because in the now, like, I know now. Mm -hmm. I know what's going to happen in the future. So, yeah. yeah, there are people, like, in his case, which is great that he's able to adjust certain things. Yeah. But there are other people that probably won't. So, yeah. it's like you constantly go to at night sleeping. And, and honestly, like, sometimes do you really need a gene test to know that? Yeah. If you have family members that have Alzheimer's, there's a risk that you're probably gonna have Alzheimer's. Like I have a risk of developing Alzheimer's, but yeah. I'm not gonna go test myself right now and be like, I a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, like you know. And and again, I don't know when that's gonna happen. Is that early onset? Is that yeah, later onset? That's it. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I. But that's my opinion. The 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 part of it that like really really got me was when they put him into this dinner setting with his wife, and they had dressed her up as i mean not dressed her up but they had done i can't think of the word right now but they did like all this mask and all this like stuff on her to make her look like if she's in her 60s or 70s because uh -huh. then they were saying like oh maybe you if you develop alzheimer's like in your 50s mm -hmm. you won't see her age okay so then he's like you do you want to see her at that age he's like of course i want to see my wife at that age so that's what they did. They set up like a dinner or whatever of her being like in her 60s or 70s or whatever. And it was so emotional. I'm not an emotional person. I'm not. Oh. Like it's hard to get me to cry over movies or shows or whatever. And I was like holding Bawling. it. And I... You wanted to ball. I wanted to. I was like, that... I felt that. Yeah. Like I, I, I actually felt that in there. And he goes and he's like, 
I may never see you like this and you look so beautiful. And she's so self-conscious because imagínate, like yeah. she's a gorgeous fucking goddess. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Elsa then, Pataki is beautiful. Yeah. And then they aged her. Like they did a really, really good like prosthetics and all that stuff on her. And she's like, I, I would hate for him to see me like this. Like, yeah. I don't feel beautiful anymore. Yeah. Like it's weird. It is weird. One thing is aging like with time and another is like oh, you're shower. in your 40s yeah. all the way to your 80s. Like, damn, you know, yeah. um, it's like that filter. So she was like self-conscious, like going to him. Yeah. And then he was just like over the moon. He was like, I love you. I will always love you. And I and I, I want to I want to remember this. So in case I don't get to see you at that age, like yeah. at least I know what you would look like. And then it was just like. Oh, my God. So <gasps> like, kill me right now. All right. So new mRNA cancer <clears throat> vaccine helps immune systems fight deadly brain tumors. This is by Corey Pelk on May 7th. So researchers at the University of Florida have developed a groundbreaking mRNA cancer vaccine aimed to treating glioblastoma, a highly aggressive and deadly form of brain cancer. It's a very sad kind of cancer. Glioblastoma affects approximately three in every 100,000 people globally each year and has been notoriously difficult to treat effectively with an average survival times just over a year despite any medical treatments. The new vaccine works by retraining the body's immune system to recognize and attack the cancer cells. It utilizes the patient's own tumor cells to create a personalized vaccine targeting a unique mRNA messenger RNA sequence of the patient's cancer. The innovative approach allows for highly personalized treatment, potentially making it applicable and commercializable to a wide range of patients. In preliminary tests, the vaccine was administered to 10 pet dogs with naturally occurring brain tumors, resulting on an average survival time of 139 days, significantly longer than typically 30 to 60 day survival rates for dogs with this condition. Encouraged by these results, the researchers conducted a small FDA-approved clinical trial involving four human participants with glioblastoma. A trial showed that within less than 48 hours of receiving the vaccine, the patient's brain tumor transitioned from a cold state with a few immune cells and a silenced immune response to a hot state characterized by an active immune response. So what that means is that their vaccine was actually like working and attacking that tumor. Mm -hmm. So this rapid activation of immune system is notable as vaccines typically take weeks or months to even start working. While it is still early to fully assess the clinical effects of the mRNA cancer vaccine, the initial human study participants either lived disease-free longer than expected or survived longer than expected. This early success has paved the way for larger clinical trials and has generated optimism among researchers and medical professionals about the potential mRNA vaccines in treating glioblastoma and possibly other types of cancer. So this is incredible. incredible. Glioblastoma is really sad. Horrific. Like, it's just a terrible... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrific. I mean, there's a lot of terrible things. But the fact that there was... Really bad it worked so quickly within 48 hours. Yeah, within 48, 48 hours, they're already seeing some sort of action, which That's... is great. And when you're talking about glioblastoma, Oof. like, time is time is ticking. <clears throat> All right. So alcohol-related deaths of U.S. healthcare workers mm -hmm. by Mark Olson, MD, MPH, Candace Cosgrove, MPH and Melanie Wall, PhD, and all their friends at all. May 8th, 2024. So this article published on JAMA Network Open, authored by these people that I just mentioned, focused on the risk of alcohol-related deaths among U.S. healthcare workers compared to non-healthcare workers. The study is a cohort analysis that examines whether healthcare professionals are more susceptible to deaths due to alcohol-related causes. The findings suggest that healthcare workers do not have a higher general risk of dying from alcohol-related issues compared to the general population. This challenges some common misconceptions that healthcare workers, due to the stress and accessibility of substances in their work environment, might be a greater risk of substance abuse and related mortalities. The study provides important insights into occupational health and safety for healthcare professionals, emphasizing that the risk factors for alcohol-related deaths are similar between healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers, which is true because I've always heard and seen like, oh yeah, you know, if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're this and that, you're you're more likely to have an addictive personality and want to like numb that stress and whatever. And I'm glad that they're kind of debunking that. You yeah, know? yeah. So so yeah. Right. So California city declares a public health emergency after tuberculosis sickens 14. Ah. <sighs> California, this is terrible. Man. California. So this is by Aria Bendix, updated on May 8th. 
The city of Long Beach, California is on the verge of declaring a public health emergency following a tuberculosis outbreak that has affected 14 people in a single room occupancy hotel. The si- 14 people, single room occupancy. So it's, yeah, but it's a whole, the whole hotel is single room occupancy hotel, but there's 14 people in that whole hotel that got this. Does that okay. make sense? Okay, okay, okay. So like the, the hotel is yeah. single rooms. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's 14, there's people, 14 people in, in that, that hotel. Room. Yeah. Oh, in, in, in the hotel or in the room? Yeah, in the hotel. Okay. The people at a single room occupancy hotel. That affected 14 people. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's okay. like in the hotel, 14 people. All right. So 14 people got affected. <laughs> okay. In this hotel. Yeah. That holds single room occupancies. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's a thousand ways of saying the same thing. So the city council is expected to approve this declaration soon. This outbreak has led to nine hospitalizations and one death. Yeah. Approximately 175 people have been exposed to the disease. The local health department is actively responding by isolating infectious patients, providing them with treatment and offering temporary housing, food and transportation. The emergency declaration will help the health department mobilize more resources for tuberculosis screening and treatment. The outbreak primarily affects vulnerable populations, including those experiencing homelessness, which increases their risk due to factors like weakened immune systems and substance use and crowded living conditions. Other health conditions such as diabetes, cancer, and HIV also complicate the ability to fight tuberculosis infections. Yeah. Tuberculosis is very contagious, especially it's airborne. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is why they're saying if you're in one room or anything like you and someone has active TB, because you can have latent TB. There's two different forms, an episode for another day. Yeah. But if you have active TB and you're in the same room as that person, you are very at risk to the point where you should be tested. You should be screened. Okay? Yeah. 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 TB is not a, not a joke. My God. California is probably like, what the? Who knows? There's a lot going on with California these Who's days. Who's patient zero? I want to know who patient zero is. Yeah. Good luck with that. Like, that's just, that's a, a rojo mano. Everyone's probably like, oh, you did it. I saw you coughing. I drank from his pouch of tea. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sorry, California. <laughs> I should have said that. Okay. No. It's it's a comedy show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so burden of times. Yeah, I mean, you know, for the most part. Yeah. We're mixing it, you know. Yeah. If you if you're here, you get it. Anyway, so burden of mental disorders and suicide attributable to childhood maltreatment by Lucinda Grummitz, PhD, and Jesse R. Baldwin, PhD, and Joanna Flawa. Flawai? Yeah, sorry. Lafoy. And her friends. Yes. Uh, May 8th. Lucinda, <laughs> Joanna, and Jesse. Uh, Thanks, girls. <laughs> <laughs> on May 8th, 2024. So the study published on JAMA Psychiatry investigates the long-term impact of childhood maltreatment on mental health and the risk of suicide. The research highlights that individuals who experience maltreatment during childhood, such as physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, are at a significantly higher risk of developing mental disorders and are more likely to attempt or commit suicide later in life. The study quantifies the burden of mental health issues and suicide that can be directly attributed to early childhood maltreatment. It emphasizes a critical need for early intervention and support for the children who are victims of abuse to potentially reduce the prevalence of mental health disorders and decrease the incidence of suicide among the population. This research underscores the profound and lasting effects of childhood maltreatment on mental health and the importance of addressing these issues from a public health perspective, advocating for policies and practices that protect children and support the at-risk populations throughout their lives. So, and I know May was Mental Health Month, so yeah. Yeah. it's good to see yeah. that they're putting a little bit of attention to that at least, you know. Yes. So this was super interesting. I know. Check this out. So Ozempic babies, reports of surprise pregnancies raised new questions about weight loss drugs. This is by Mira Cheng and Meg Terrell on May 8th. So an article from CNN discusses a phenomenon known as azepic babies, which refers to unexpected pregnancies that occur in individuals taking GLP-1 receptor agonists like azepic, Lajaro, for weight loss. These medications primarily used to treat conditions such as diabetes and obesity have been linked to improved fertility, particularly in those individuals with polycystic ovarian syndrome, a common fertility 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 barrier. I can't say the word either. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> the article highlights the story of Katera Bentley, a 25-year-old from Steele, Alabama, who experienced an unexpected pregnancy after losing weight on Manjaro. 
Despite her previous struggles with PCOS and infertility, Bentley's weight loss seemed to have normalized her menstrual cycles and ultimately led to her pregnancy. However, this unexpected outcome brought her anxiety due to uncertain side effects or to, due to uncertain effects of GLP-1 drugs during pregnancy. While there's an anecdotal evidence suggesting that weight loss from GLP-1 drugs may improve fertility, comprehensive scientific data on their safety during pregnancy is still lacking. However, preliminary studies have not shown major concerns. Both Novo Nordisk and Ellie Lilly, the manufacturers of dr these drugs, have established pregnancy registries to collect more data on the safety medications during pregnancy with results expected at the end of these studies. So what I would like to see a follow-up of this is, did these women also get improved? Well, first of all, we need, they need to study to, like what yeah. they did. They need to have these registries to see mm -hmm. if it really does improve fertility. And then the next step would be, is it Ozempic that's improving the fertility or is it the weight loss? So which yeah. it has been known for a very, very long time to that obesity is harder for someone to get pregnant just because of B hormones and everything yeah. that influence and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think it's incredible for, you know, that this is, could be potentially an option for someone that's yeah. trying to have a baby and is obese or Tell something you, like that. These drugs are miracle drugs. Yeah. Miracle drugs. Yep. Like, it's incredible. I, when I saw that, I'm like, and it's a lot of them, a lot yeah. of people that are reporting this, yeah. you know? So. It's crazy. All right, so Martinelli apple juice recalled in more than 30 states over elevated arsenic levels by Corn Miller, updated on May 9th, 2024. So S. Martinelli and company has initiated a recall for a specific production lot of its one liter Martinelli's apple juice due to detection of inorganic arsenic levels exceeding the FDA guidelines. The affected apple juice was found to contain 11.6 parts per billion of inorganic arsenic, which is above the FDA's action level of 10 parts Perfect. per billion. The recall affects bottles with best buy dates of March 9th, 2026 and March 10th, 2026. These bottles were distributed between March 13, 2023 and September 27, 2023, primarily before July 28, 2023. Elevated levels of inorganic arsenic can pose health risks such as cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular issues. However, no illnesses or complaints related to the recalled apple juice have been reported so far. So keep an eye out for those. All right, so 116 kids left vulnerable to measles and polio after nurse falsifies vaccine records. Can you believe this? Like, yes, I, I, I can. Actually. I I I was so pissed off reading this article. Yeah, and she puts other kids at risk. They didn't mention that, but okay. Yeah. All right, so by Mary Kikato on May 9th on ABC News. So a nurse in upstate New York identified as Sandra Maselli or Michelli, I don't know if that's it, but no. Maselli has been accused of falsifying vaccine records for over 100 children. This serious allegation involves the manipulation of medical records to falsely indicate that these children had received their vaccinations when they had not. The case had raised concerns about integrity of the medical documentation and potential health risks to unvaccinated children. Pause. Oh. Okay, pause. It's not only unvaccinated children. It is also children that are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So it's all children, mm -hmm. okay? Just because someone is vaccinated does not protect you 100%. Yeah. So you are a nurse that got paid because that's the only reason you did it, okay? You got paid to do this, mm -hmm. okay? By people that are wrong because that's also wrong and also very irresponsible and just negligent of everyone but themselves the people that actually paid for people to do this mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. because you probably wanted to send your kids somewhere that needed vaccinations and you didn't want to but in order to have it your way mm -hmm. you decided to pay someone to falsify those records meaning that you have placed other people at risk and don't come okay saying oh but we don't even see measles anymore yes we do clearly it's all over the yes, news yes we do Yes, we do. And it's coming back because of people like you. Yeah. So it's inc like I, I just want to like exploit all these people. Oh, 100 percent. I want to exploit like all these people. Ugh, and they're the worst. It's very sad, but it the, happens. The worst. It happens. The absolute worst. And that nurse should go to jail. 100 percent. There's 100%. no other. And she should not be practicing. No, she should not be practicing. No. And she should be stripped of everything. She should go to jail. Yeah. Because you only did it for your own benefit. Right. Putting at risk everyone else and for your own benefit because you wanted to make some cash. 
the self righteousness of of it all. You no, know, but this, she's a just she's a disgusting person. That's it. There's many disgusting people in the world that she can join the group. Exactly. So. On the next one, Elon Musk's Neuralink chip suffers unexpected setback in first human brain implant. Womp womp. We were so excited about this. We literally had this on our recap last time. I know. I know. And that's, know. that's the beauty of these, these. That's the beauty of these recaps that you see one thing and then you may see an update on it and the next one. By Shannon Thaler, published on May 9th, 2024. So Elon Musk's company Neuralink experienced a setback with its first human brain implant. The device was designed to help paralyzed individuals control technology with their thoughts. It began to detach from the patient's skull, leading to a decrease in data capture. The patient, 29-year-old Noland Arbal, I think that's how you say the last name, who was paralyzed from the shoulders down, had the device implanted in January as part of a six-year safety trial. Despite initial success, it demonstrated in a video where Arbal played video games using his mind. The device later encountered issues with some of its components retracting from the brain, reducing its effectiveness. So, I mean, like all these technologies, it's trial and error. error. Mm-hmm. At least it works. Yeah, I know. It, I mean, it's seemingly it's, working. It's crazy. You know, yeah. It, yeah. Just the, the whole thing of it is creepy. But the fact that it even works, yeah. you know, it's it's just perfecting that. This one I wanted you to read, so I'm glad that you're reading it. All right. So UK toddler has hearing restored in world's first gene therapy trial. I love these. Oh, my God. I these, know. They these bring videos such joy. make me cry every single time. But they make me feel so happy. Yeah. These are it's this just is like good news in It's in pure. Yeah. It's just pure, innocent goodness. Like, yes. Ugh. So this is by Andrew Gregory on May 9th, published on The Guardian. In a significant medical breakthrough, a young British toddler named Opal Sandy. I love my name, Opal. Me too. Opal Sandy has has successfully... Okay, Opal Sandy has successfully regained her hearing through a world first gene therapy trial. Opal, who was born with auditory neuropathy, a condition that prevents sound signals from being properly transmitted from the inner ear to the brain, underwent a revolutionary treatment that involves infusion of a functional gene to correct the faulty one causing her deafness. This treatment was administered during a brief 16-minute procedure. 16 minutes. 16 That's incredible. Yeah. At Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, United Kingdom. The trial, known as the CORD trial, is being conducted in a phase and will eventually include 18 children from around the world. Opal was the first child to receive this therapy, and the results have been promising, with her parents witnessing her ability to hear for the first time. This pioneering approach uses a harmless virus to deliver the correct gene into the patient's body, offering a new potential method for treating certain types of deafness in children. Oh my god, we should post the video. I yeah. wonder if they have a video. They oh, no, no, they video. do. They do. Yeah, they they do. It was part of the article. Like, yeah. you go to the article and then they have their oh like a video. Or that, it's it beautiful. It makes me cry every it's, single it's time. It's beautiful because you just see like, like kids that put on glasses for the first time and they see every. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I know. I know. It's it's beautiful. I love it. I love yeah. it. And I'm so glad to see this type of technology. Yeah. Like, this is a goodness. Yeah. You know? Anyway, so on a very different note, how to find out if a woman is a psychopath. I can't even believe that this is. <laughs> This is a thing. I had to put this. Yeah. There's one obvious tell, experts say, by Asia, is, uh, yeah, Asia, Asia Grace. Grace. On, that's actually a very pretty, like, Asia Grace <laughs> on May 9th, 2024. What's your name? Asia Grace. Her name is Asia Grace. You don't just say Asia. You're Asia Grace. Yeah. Anyway, so a recent study conducted by researchers from the University of New Mexico suggests that women who keep their heads unusually still while talking may exhibit higher levels of psychopathic traits <laughs> I'm just asking myself, do I shake my head? Do I not? I, I don't stop. I'm the whole time like this. Just watch this video. I don't think that I move my head a lot. I don't know. I guess I'll look back now when I'm editing. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I have right. a lot of facial expressions. Does that stack out? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, Anyways. So this study, which focused on incarcerated women, used... I mean, okay, first of all, you're you're looking at incarcerated women. This is a very biased, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. sample yeah. that you're getting this from. But anyway. There's which, definitely some bias here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so focus on incarcerated women used an automated detection algorithm to analyze head movements during conversations. Look, I just did it right now. Like, I'm I'm constantly, like... I'm very, like, Hispanic with that. I'm, like, just moving. <laughs> anyway, so the findings in indicate that the minimal head movement could be nonverbal indicator of psychopathy, which includes... Psychopathy? Psychopathy. 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 <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank God that's not one of the traits because I'd be fucked. <laughs> I'm mispronouncing words. 
so which includes traits like manipulation, lack of remorse, and impulsivity. The research assessed 213 female inmates analyzing their head positions from video recorded interviews to determine the correlation between head movement and psychopathic tendencies. Again, very biased sample. Asia. Asia Miss, Asia Grace. So time for you to come out with one on men's. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Anyway, this one I is yeah, it made a lot of the, waves. All right. Brain yeah. worms, like the one in RFK Jr.'s head, are actually a global problem. We're going to not talk about politics yes. at all here. Yeah. We, it, it just it went everywhere. Yeah. And we're going to talk about what this particular worm he was talking about. It so it's by Lauren J. Young on May 10th, 2024. So the article from Scientific American discussed how individuals can contract parasitic brain worms with a focus on the case of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who had a parasitic brain infection. Initially suspecting a brain tumor due to symptoms like memory loss and mental health fog in 2010. Mental fog. What? I said mental health, right? Yeah. Okay. Initially, I, 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 yeah. I said psychopathy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Initially suspecting a brain tumor due to symptoms like memory loss and mental fog, a 2010 brain scan of, Kennedy's, uh, of Kennedy revealed a cyst containing remains of a parasite. The exact species of parasite and the source of the infection were not identified, but it was suggested that Kennedy likely contracted the parasitic infection during his extensive travels to Africa, South America, and Asia. The article explains that the parasitic infections affecting the brain, such as those caused by tenosolium. I, I hate anything parasitic. I know all about... They're so fascinating. The pork... Pork tapeworm. Julia... Yeah, the that, pork tape worm. That one's very dangerous. It's more dangerous than the Tania something or uh, that's so beef form one. It's Ill. yeah. And the Bayless Ascaris and Procyonis, okay, it was the raccoon roundworm, occur all these all these parasites, okay, occur through specific pathways. So for instance, Tania solium can infect humans not directly through the consumption of undercooked pork, but rather through contact with fecal material containing tapeworm eggs. Yeah. This can lead to neurosis or sarcosis, a serious condition manifesting neurologically and often leading to seizures, hydrocephalus, and memory loss. This condition is prevalent in regions like Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and parts of Asia, and is the leading cause of acquired seizures in these areas. So the article also discusses the diagnosis and treatment of neurosysosarcosis, which involves imaging studies like CT scans or MRIs and tests for parasitic antibodies. Treatment typically includes medication to address symptoms such as seizures and hydrocephalus. Sometimes in more severe cases, surgery is necessary. Overall, the article highlights the complexity of diagnosing and treating parasitic infections of the brain and underscores the importance of awareness and research, especially given the global travel patterns that can facilitate the spread of these parasites. I feel like worms in the brain is becoming a thing now, and I maybe a neurologist should, should start asking, like, have you traveled? Well, yeah, I think they, I think that's part of like their questionnaire and whatever, but like it's, it's pretty, it, yeah, it's pretty bad. Anyway, so low testosterone linked with mortality risk in aging men by Jeff Minard on May 13, 2024. So the article published on MedPage Today discusses the finding of meta-analysis that investigated the relationship between low testosterone levels and mortality risk in aging men. The meta-analysis utilized mass spectrometry, mm -hmm. a method known for its high accuracy to measure testosterone levels in the study participants. The study analyzed data from multiple research studies and found that low testosterone levels are significantly associated with a risk of mortality in aging men. The association was particularly noted with cardiovascular deaths, suggesting that low testosterone levels could be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and related mortality. The article emphasizes the importance of accurate testosterone measurement using mass spectrometry to ensure reliable data. The findings of this meta-analysis contribute to the growing body of evidence linking hormonal health to overall mortality risk in older men, highlighting the potential need for monitoring and managing testosterone levels in this population. So yeah, I just know that that's a very common thing these days at least like you even have like men health spas or men like online things but you could go online to get these you know testosterone yeah. supplements and all that's pretty easy for men to get these days yeah so our last one because this just this came out crazy, and yeah. it's very scary so this is kind of like picking back again off of our other recaps um yeah. so now this is kind of like an update yeah if you've been following us so the cdc is prepping for possibility of increased risk to human health from bird flu 
So before, in our previous recap, they were saying, Not so anymore. far, there's no risk. Yeah, they were right? like, oh, no, don't worry about it. Not anymore. Now, we're, there's a risk. And they're okay? worrying about it now. Yeah. So this is by Catherine Kahn, and this was published on May 24th. So bird flu, also known as avian influenza, is a virus that primarily infects birds, but can sometimes spread to humans. Recently, there have been more cases of bird flu in wild birds and poultry, which raises concerns about it spreading to people. The CDC is taking steps to monitor the situation closely and prepare for any potential outbreaks. This includes working in health departments, hospitals, and other organizations to ensure that they are ready to respond for the virus that starts spreading among humans. They are also keeping an eye on the changes in the virus that may make it more likely to infect people. While the risk to the general public is still low, the CDC wants to prepare just in case. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are encouraging people to work with birds sorry <laughs> work with birds no. right now no <laughs> so they're encouraging people who work with birds such as farmers and veterinarians to take extra precautions to protect themselves from the virus so now it's becoming a worry yeah i don't know about that whole entire still no risk guys but... uh, yeah it's 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 a little worrisome yeah you know the trend of this news but anyway so Thank you guys so much for tuning in to our weekly. This yeah. was our recap. It came a little later than we had anticipated, but hey, we're here and we're giving it to you. <laughs> giving it to you. <laughs> Better late than never. Exactly. And uh, thank you guys for everything. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash funny medicine podcast. We have close to 40, if not already 40 full episodes on completely different topics there. And it comes out every Friday morning. So you would have these weeklies on Tuesdays. And then you have a whole other episode, a whole other thing with us on, on Fridays. Also, the videos for these episodes come out on the day that the audio comes out. Yeah. Versus having to wait a whole additional week. If you're a Patreon, you see it right on the day that these come out. So, and you'd be helping to support the show. Yes. You know, so that's always, that's always a plus. Anyways, uh, keep doing everything you guys are doing. Talk to us on any form of social media suggest things talk to us we love talking to you all and uh we'll see you on the next one